Hi, I'm Marty Nemco. This is the first short story written by somebody other than me, but I wanted to read it to you because I really like it, and it was also the inspiration for the short, short story I just wrote called The Envelope Stuffer. It's a classic by James Thurber. It's called The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. We're going through! The commander's voice was like thin ice breaking. He wore his full-dress uniform with the heavily braided white cap pulled down rakishly over one cold gray eye. We can't make it, sir. It's spoiling for a hurricane, if you ask me. I'm not asking you, Lieutenant Berg, said the commander. Throw on the power lights. Rev her up to 8,500. We're going through. The pounding of the cylinders increased. To pocket, to pocket, to pocket, to pocket, to pocket. The commander stared at the ice forming on the pilot's window. He walked over and twisted a row of complicated dials. Switch on number eight auxiliary, he shouted. Switch on number eight auxiliary, repeated Lieutenant Berg. Full strength at number three turret, shouted the commander. Full strength at number three. The crew, bending to their various tasks in the huge, hurtling, eight-engine Navy hydroplane, looked at each other and grinned. The old man will get us through, they said to one another. The old man ain't afraid of hell. Not so fast. You're driving too fast, said Mrs. Mitty. What are you driving so fast for? Hmm, said Walter Mitty. He looked at his wife in the seat beside him with shocked astonishment. She seemed grossly unfamiliar, like a strange woman who had yelled at him in a crowd. You were up to 55, she said. You know I don't like to go more than 40. You were up to 55. Walter Mitty drove on toward Waterbury in silence. The roaring of, the, uh, of her SN202, I guess that's an old car, through the worst storm in 20 years of Navy flying fading in the remote, intimate airways of his mind. You've tensed up again, said Mrs. Mitty. It's one of your days. I wish you would let Dr. Renshaw look you over. Walter Mitty stopped the car in front of the building where his wife went to get her hair done. Remember to get those overshoes while I'm getting my hair done, she said. I don't need overshoes, said Mitty. She put her mirror back into the bag. We've been all through that, she said, getting out of the car. You're not a young man anymore. He raced the engine a little. Why don't you wear your gloves? Have you lost your gloves? Walter Mitty reached in a pocket and brought out the gloves. He put them on, but after she had turned and gone into the building and he had driven to a red light, he took them off again. Pick it up, brother, snapped the cop as the light changed, and Mitty hastily put on his gloves and lurched ahead. He drove around the streets aimlessly for a time, and then he drove past the hospital on the way to the parking lot. It's the millionaire banker, Wellington McMillan, said the pretty nurse. Yes, said Walter Mitty, removing his gloves slowly. Who has the case? Dr. Renshaw and Dr. Benbow, but there are two specialists here, Dr. Remington from New York and Dr. Pritchard Mitford from London. He flew over. A door opened down a long, cool corridor, and Dr. Renshaw came out. He looked distraught and haggard. Hello, Mitty, he said. We're having the devil of time with Macmillan, the millionaire, the banker, and close personal friend of Roosevelt. Obstriosus of the ductal tract, tertiary. Wish you would take a look at him. Glad to, said Mitty. In the operating room, there were whispered introductions. Dr. Remington, Dr. Mitty, Dr. Pritchard Mitford, Dr. Mitty. I've read your book on streptococcus, said Mitchard, Pritchard, <laughs> Pritchard Mitford, shaking hands. A brilliant performance, sir. Thank you, said Walter Mitty. Didn't know you were in the States, Mitty, grumbled Remington. Coles to Newcastle, bringing Mitford and me up here for a tertiary. Ah, oh, you're very kind, said Mitty. A huge, complicated machine connected to the operating table with many tubes and wires began at this moment to go pocketa, pocketa, pocketa. The new anesthetizer is giving way, shouted an intern. There is no one in the East who knows how to fix it. Quiet man, said Mitty in a low, cool voice. He sprang to the machine, which was now going pocket a pocket a pocket a creep. He began fingering delicately a row of glistening dials. Give me a fountain pen, he snapped. Someone handed him a fountain pen. He pulled a faulty piston out of the machine and inserted the pen, inserted the pen into its place. That'll hold for ten minutes, he said. Get on with the operation. A nurse hurried over and whispered to Renshaw, and Mitty saw the man turn pale. Coriopsis is set in, said Renshaw nervously. If you would take over, Mitty... Mitty looked at him and the craven figure of Benbow, who drank, and at the grave, uncertain faces of the two great specialists. 
If you wish, he said. They slipped a white gown on him, he adjusted a mask, and drew on thin gloves, nurses handing him shiny. Back it up, Mac! Look out for that Buick! Walter Mitty jammed on the brakes. Wrong lane, Mac! And the parking lot attendant, looking at Mitty closely. Gee, yeah! muttered Mitty. He began cautiously to back out of the lane marked exit only. Leave her sit there, said the attendant. I'll put her away. Mitty got out of the car. Hey, better leave the key. Oh, said Mitty, handling the man the ignition key, handing the man the ignition key. The attendant vaulted into the car, backed it up with insolent skill, and put it where it belonged. They're so damn cocky, thought Walter Mitty, walking along Main Street. They think they know everything. Once he had tried to take his chains off outside New Milford, and he had gotten him wound around the axle. The man had to come out in it with a wrecking car and unwind him, a young grinning garage man. Since then, Mrs. Mitty always made him drive to a garage to have the chains taken off. The next time he thought, I'll wear my right arm in a sling so they won't grin at me. I'll have my right arm in a sling and then they'll see I couldn't possibly take the chains off myself. He kicked at the slush on the sidewalk. Over shoes, he said, and began looking for a shoe store. When he came out into the street again with the overshoes in a box under his arm, Walter Mitty began to wonder what the other thing was his wife had told him to get. She had told him twice before they set out from the house for Waterbury. In a way, he hated those weekly trips to town. He was always getting something wrong. Kleenex, he thought. Squibs? Razor blades? No. Toothpaste? Toothbrush? Bicarbonate? Carborundum? Initiative and referendum? He gave up. But she would remember it. Where's the what's-it-name, she would ask. Don't tell me you forgot the what's-its-name. A newsboy went by shouting something about the Waterbury trial. Perhaps this will refresh your memory. The district attorney suddenly thrust a heavy automatic at the quiet figure in the witness stand. Have you ever seen this before? Walter Mitty took the gun and examined it expertly. This is my Webley Vickers 5080, he said calmly. An excited buzz ran around the courtroom. The judge rapped for order. You are a crack shot with any sort of firearms, I believe, said the district attorney insinuatingly. Objection, shouted Mitty's attorney. We have shown that the defendant could not have fired that shot. We have shown that he wore his right arm in a sling on the night of the 14th of July. Walter Mitty raised his hand briefly and the bickering attorneys were stilled. With any known make of gun, he said evenly, I could have killed Gregory Fitzhurst at 300 feet with my left hand. Pandemonium broke loose in the courtroom. A woman's scream rose above the bedlam, and suddenly a lovely, dark-haired girl was in Mitty's arms. The district attorney struck at her savagely. Without rising from his chair, Mitty let the man have it on the point of the chin. You miserable cur! Puppy biscuit, said Walter. He stopped walking. The buildings of Waterbury rose up out of the misty courtroom and surrounded him again. A woman who was passing laughed. He said, puppy biscuits, she said to her companion. That man said puppy biscuit to himself. Walter Mitty hurried on. He went into an AMP, not the first one he came to, but a smaller one further up the street. I want some biscuit for small young dogs, he said to the clerk. Any special brand, sir? The greatest pistol shot in the world, thought for a moment. It says puppy bark on the box, said Walter Mitty. His wife would be through at the hairdressers in 15 minutes. Mitty saw him in looking at a watch, unless they had trouble drying it. Sometimes they had trouble drying it. She didn't like to get to the hotel first. She would want him to be there waiting for her as usual. He found a big leather chair in the lobby facing a window, and he put the overshoes and the puppy biscuit on the floor beside it. He picked up an old copy of Liberty and sank down into the chair. Can Germany conquer the world through the air? Walter Mitty looked at the pictures of bombing planes and of ruined streets. The cannonading has got the wind up in young Raleigh, sir, said the sergeant. Captain Mitty looked up at him through tousled hair. Get him to bed, he said wearily. With the others, I'll fly alone. But you can't, sir, said the sergeant anxiously. It takes two men to handle that bomber, and the Archies are pounding the hell out of the air. Von Rickman's circus is between here and Solier. Someone's got to get that ammunition dump, said Mitty. I'm going to go over there. Spot a brandy. He poured a drink for the sergeant and one for himself. War thundered and whined around the dugout and battered at the door. There was a rending of wood and splinters flew through the room. A bit of a near thing, said Captain Mitty carelessly. The box barrage is closing in, said the sergeant. We only live once, sergeant, said Mitty with his faint fleeting smile. Or do we? He poured another brandy and tossed it off. 
I never see a man could hold his brandy like you, sir, said the sergeant. Begging your pardon, sir. Captain Minnie stood up and strapped on his huge Webley Vickers automatic. It's 40 kilometers through hell, sir, said the sergeant. Mitty finished one last brandy. After all, he said softly, what isn't? The pounding of the cannon increased. There was a red tat tatting of machine guns, and from somewhere came the menacing pocket a pocket a pocket of the new flamethrowers. Walter Mitty walked to the door of the dugout, humming, Après de la Bande. He turned and waved to the sergeant. Cheerio, he said. Something struck his shoulder. I've been looking all over this hotel for you, said Mrs. Mitty. Why do you have to hide in this old chair? How do you expect me to find you? Things close in, said Walter Mitty vaguely. What? Mrs. Mitty said. Did you get the what's-his-name, the, the puppy biscuit, the what's in that box? Overshoes, said Mitty. Couldn't you have put them on in the store, his wife said. I was thinking, said Walter Mitty. Does it ever occur to you that I am sometimes thinking? She looked at him. I'm going to take your temperature when I get home, she said. They went out through the revolving doors that made a faintly derisive whistling sound when you pushed them. It was two blocks of the parking lot. At the drugstore on the corner, she said, wait here for me. I forgot something. It'll be just a minute. She was more than a minute. It began to rain. Rain with sleet in it. He stood up against the wall of the drugstore. He put her shoulders back and his heels together. The hell with the handkerchief, said Walter Mitty scornfully. Then... With that faint, fleeting smile playing about in his lips, he faced the firing squad, erect and motionless, proud and disdainful, Walter Mitty, the undefeated, inscrutable to the last. In any case, that short story is called The, is the Secret Life of Walter Mitty uh, by uh, the eminent James Thurber. Uh, in any event, I welcome your thumbs up and accept your thumbs down. I always look forward to your comments and especially like it if you hit the share button below. Share on your social media so that my efforts can have broader impact. And I am flattered if you choose to subscribe to my channel. In any event, I do thank you for watching. I am Marty Nemco.